Hey, what's up, everybody? I am Jerry Ozier, and this is day 22 of Advent of Cyber on Try Hack Me. I am so pumped for the opportunity to do one of these rooms, to be part of Advent of Cyber. We're going to have a lot of fun today. I'm super excited. So let's get right into it, shall we? All right. So the day that we have is called Attack Surface Reduction. Attack Surface Reduction. And Basically, you know, the story here is that McSkitty wants to improve security posture of Santa's network by learning from recent attempts to disrupt Christmas. And this is actually a pretty common uh, technique used in real life because when you do have an incident, which, which is unfortunate, but, you know, things happen. When you do have an incident, typically you want to have a lessons learned event after the fact to say, how do we get hit? Like, what can we do about it? Is there anything that we can do to help limit the likelihood of this happening again or reduce the impact of this negative event happening again? And this is all about attack surface reduction. And it's a really, really valuable technique. Now, McSkitty's first step, she plans to implement low effort, high value changes that improve the security posture significantly, which makes a total no brainer, right? If you can do something wicked fast that has real risk reduction, why wouldn't you do it? Especially if it's like low or no cost. Basic, basic things that you set it once and it's good to go. But let's talk about this. In this lecture or this you know day of activities, what are you gonna learn, okay? So we're helping McSkitty with her improvements, but you're actually gonna take from this a couple things. One, you're gonna understand exactly what an attack vector is. We'll talk about the concept of the attack surface and how they relate to each other. Then we'll do some examples and I'll, I'll be sprinkling in my own thoughts as, <laughs> as we go here. So an attack vector, it's a tool or technique or method used to attack a system or a network. An attack vector is some technique that can get to your systems and cause uh, damage or you know a performance impact to your confidentiality, your integrity, your availability, right? So you've got your, your kind of social engineering ones, like your phishing emails or your smishes or something like that, right? Where you're just trying to attack the human. You've got uh, the bottom one there, unpatched vulnerability explo exploitation. So a much more technical attack, right? There's a vulnerability. You got some shell code or an exploit or something like that, and you throw it at it, and boom, you're logged in with you know elevated privileges or whatever. And they use uh, an example in the, in the story here of thinking of it as weapons, like swords, hammers, arrows. These are kind of like the tools uh, or techniques that you can use. Also want to point out that you can attack processes as well. So you always really got to think about people, process, and technology and being able to uh, build resiliency and security across those three dimensions. And if you're an attacker or an offsec person, thinking about how you could attack those three things. That's your attack vector. So for your attack surface, this is the one that most people commonly think of. This is anything that's exposed in any way that could allow an attacker uh, to compromise you through one of these attack vectors. Again, sticking with this kind of medieval um, example, they talk about the areas on the uh, the knight or the soldier that it doesn't have uh, chain mail, right? So you see this like famously in in movies where oh, Achilles, right? Because the the Achilles heel, right? So that dude was like shredded and wicked and vulnerable to anything except his heel. That was his attack surface. You know what I mean? So for modern technology and modern networks and stuff like this, what we tend to think of as our attack surface, and we really need to be mindful about this, is anything that is, well, it can be a bunch of things, but the, the major one is anything internet facing, uh, any type of technology that's internet facing. So if you have you know email servers, or you have web servers, application servers, that type of technology, VPN, you know, termination endpoints, like that type of stuff, yes, you you can hit it. Everybody's working remotely, right? Or lots of people were working remotely. You can access those devices from home, but you've got to remember that threat actors can access those devices as well. Now, you have defenses in place to harden your attack surface or reduce your attack surface to have less of it. But if you don't do the things you're supposed to do, then the threat actors can take advantage of it, right? It's like being mindful of where on your armor you have gaps, like under your arm or something like that, and being mindful that like there's a policy that you always keep your arms down, or 
you buy a you know a new piece of security technology and you slap it up under your arm and there you go now you've you kind of reduced that risk now let's talk about our attack surface reduction and this is where we get paid right guys this is Great this cash, is where all homie. the money is okay this is how we get paid now it says in the story here the attack surface can't be eliminated right this is absolutely true you can't um you can't remove all risk. That's a fact, okay? That's why risk is an entire thing. There's always going to be some residual risk, no matter how hard you harden something or how tight in the security is. They use an example here of the Greek phalanx at the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, the Battle of the 300, uh, famously told. And the idea here was individually, they had a lot of attack surface, but they were able to band together uh, to have a really unified front, which made it less of an attack surface for the individual soldier. And then they were in the uh, the passageway, that narrow uh, Thermopylae pass, which basically made it so their sides were protected as well. Um, this is just an example to indicate how they reduced their physical attack surface, so we can all kind of have a metaphor around it. In cybersecurity, there are multiple, multiple ways to reduce your attack surface. And again, you really should think about it from a people process and technology perspective, right? So for technology, if you have a web server looking at the internet and you have every service turned on, this thing is lit up like a Christmas tree, <laughs> right? That's not good unless you need all of those services. But in reality, you probably don't need all those services. And each one of those services that you don't need is delivering no value to your, to your business or to your organization, but it is introducing additional risk attack surface to threat actors. So this is an easy opportunity from a technical perspective. You got to uh, dial it down until it's just the services you want, and then make sure that the services that are running, let's say... Uh, an Apache web server, right? You want to make sure that those things are kept up to date because you don't want a technical exploitation happening. Okay, so another quick example talking about human attack surface reduction, educating your end users, making them aware of what phishing is, about what different kind of attack techniques and campaigns threat actors use, making it interesting to them. This educates and raises the bar of your end users not falling for threat actor techniques. Now, looking at um, McSkitty and what's happened at Santa's workshop here, right? Santa's website was defaced earlier in the advent of cyber, right? When investigating, McSkitty found that the SSH port was open on the server hosting the website. This led to the attacker using the open port to gain entry. McSkitty closed this port. This is true. Now, this is a great example, right? Like, you, SSH is not uncommon to have facing the internet, but if... If you know if it's a weak password or it doesn't need to be open because no one's accessing it that way, then shut it down, right? So this is a good attack surface reduction, basic, straightforward, okay? Because it was protected by a password, the password wasn't strong, it could have gotten brute brute forced. So a strong password policy, okay, guys? Policy can be, you know, it's decided and documented, but technically enforced is the best way to do it. But you do need to have an administrative policy around it too, because people will have user accounts on systems that are not hooked into your main, you know, active directory domain. So you'll have to have a policy. So people are doing it consistently with like cloud-based systems that aren't federated and stuff like that. Uh, they do say here a timeout would be good. Maybe after five incorrect attempts, you lock out the account right? These are all great ideas. A brute force attack, if you had it uh, lock the account out after five attempts, yeah, an occasional end user might, um, you know, brick themselves and have to call a help desk. But more often than not, you're going to just keep bad guys out from trying to brute force in. Controlling the flow of information, right? McSkitty was informed by our team about our GitHub repo that contains sensitive information. Information was made private to block the attack vector. This is just more of an information disclosure, uh, data leakage thing, best practices. You know, be mindful of where your data is and your sensitive data. What is sensitive? Get that defined as well. Beware of deception. Another attack vector used to intrude in Santa's network was phishing. Got to educate your endpoint, uh, your, your endpoints, your end users on what to look for for phishing. They're your first line of defense when it comes from phishing. Excuse me, they're your last line of defense when it comes to phishing. Prepare for countering human error. The phish email targeted Santa's employees and it had malicious macros, right? 
You could configure the endpoints not to run macros. You could disable that. You could educate your end users on what to look for for macro-based attacks. A lot of good options here. A attack surface reduction can manifest itself in multiple ways, and you should take advantage of all of them if you can. McSkitty wanted the attack surface reduced from every endpoint point of view, right? So far, she had taken the steps to strengthen the network as a whole. So you've got the network hardened, but you want to harden the endpoints. Those are, you know, if, if someone falls for a fish and detonates some malware on their box, that endpoint's compromised, right? Also, people go out into, you know, outside of your network, outside of your, your company, traveling for work, sales, people go into, you know, client meetings and stuff. Those endpoints are kind of left on their own. So you've got to definitely harden them. They offer up a couple options here, Microsoft EDR or Microsoft's Attack Surface Reduction ASR rules. They got a link here. You can go check those out. And they say, make the defense invulnerable. To further strengthen infrastructure, McSkitty carried out a vuln scan highlighting vulnerabilities. This is a great technique too. Take a look at what your actual technology's uh, vulnerabilities is and then prioritize either the ones that are really easy to fix or the ones that are really, really bad, like super critical, you know, bad, especially now we're, now we're starting to get into risk here, prioritizing your external facing devices first, because anyone from the world can hammer on those. So your really critical vulns on those devices need to be prioritized. All right. So let's do the challenge here. Follow the instructions in the attached static site to help McSkitty reduce her attack surface. Let's feel it. Let's go, McSkitty. All right, y'all. So let's help McSkitty get protected. It's time to save McSkitty from the Bandit Yeti. Correct answers on the puzzle below. We'll put up shields to protect McSkitty, who's getting jacked up right now. Look at this. An arrow right to the hat. No good for that one. So let's add six shields to fully protect McSkitty. We'll go ahead and match the attack vector with the relevant ASR action that would basically reduce attack surface and reduce cyber risk, okay? So let's keep an eye on this one. Here's our attack vectors. We've got the Bandit Yeti identifying open SSH ports on the Santa's web server, a document file with malicious macros opened by a user, some sensitive data on a public repo. No good. Spoof phishing emails are sent to Santa's employees, brute forcing attempts on a password, on Santa's account, and Santa's employee finds a USB flash drive in the parking lot, plugs it into his computer, malware installs on the machine. Lot of attack surface here, people, and multiple attack vectors to get it. So let's reduce that attack surface. First, ASR option. Sensitive data from the file sharing site is removed to avoid Bandit Yeti taking advantage. We're going to move that right up into here. We got 16% improvement. Look at Bandit Yeti's got a bit of a shield. This is looking pretty good, okay? Make sure data is easy to duplicate, y'all, but making sure that it doesn't get put on public repos when it shouldn't, or it's not accidentally um, accessible. All right, unnecessary ports are closed to avoid attack attempts, right? This is least use, we talked about this. Don't need SSH, get rid of it. 33%, we got two shields on McSkitty, looking pretty good. Strong password policy is enabled to thwart brute force attacks. Strong password policy. Either, you know, too many attempts, you lock the account out. Maybe a long password, very complex, that's not in any dictionary list. Let's go ahead and map that to password brute forcing attacks is attempted on Santa's account. Nice. Not getting in that way. Not today. 50% there. McSkitty's looking pretty happy. Still getting hit in the head or uh, north of the hat, um, which is not good. Security policies are implemented to block macros on Santa's network. Document with malicious macros is opened by a user. Well, if we block macro execution, it's not happening. 66% of the way there. These shields are stacking up. Let's keep going. App blockers deployed network-wide to block execution of unknown non-whitelisted apps. Let's go ahead and put that with USB getting stuck in and malware running. Uh, I will just say as an editorial, AppLocker uh, explicitly allowing apps to run and, and not allowing all other apps to run is, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's the fantasy, right? It's the dream if we could really do it, but uh, there are a lot of challenges with implementing that particular control in real practice, just so you guys know. All right, McSkitty, we got five shields, 
The arrow's still cresting over the top. We need one more shield. Let's get rid of spoof phishing emails sent to your employees. Let's get some phishing protection on the email server. Dun, dun, dun. McSkitty is rocking and rolling. No damage here. Let's go ahead and get our flag. All right, nice job, everybody. While attack surface reduction helps, there's always a danger of a successful attack. You can never completely eliminate risk. Reducing attack surface to stop attacks, looking good. User installs dubious software from the internet, not so good. Uh, great job, try hack me. Here's our flag. Let's go ahead and drop it in. We got our flag stuck in, let's see if it's right. And it is, nailed it. Way to go, great job everybody. I hope you enjoyed day 22 of Advent of Cyber, try hack me. I'm Gerald Dozier. I had an amazing amount of fun talking about a, a attack surface reduction, attack vectors, really talking through and helping McSkitty get protected from the Bandit Yeti. I hope you all have a great holiday and we'll see you in the next challenge.